Welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, episode 17. This week, we've got the CEO of Homebusters of America, David Hicks. Uh, this week, we talk about a bunch of different things, including Wall Street versus Main Street and how the Homebusters brands are differentiating themselves from some of the Wall Street players like iBuyers coming and competing in the market, some of the impacts of having to compete with the iBuyers, lots on the data and the different research that the Homebusters brand does for their franchise uh, franchisees. And then, of course, a little bit about the franchise model. If you're not familiar with it, we cover all that and much more up on this week's episode. Don't miss out. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris with co-host Sean O'Toole with Property Radar. And today we're very excited to have the CEO of Homevestors of America, David Hicks. Welcome. Thank you. Now, I was reading your bio and it says that you started with Homevestors in 2005. Please tell me that's not your entree into the real estate market. <laughs> no, no, it is. In fact, I, I bought my first uh, investment property uh, too many years ago, uh, back in uh, probably 1978. And so uh, it had off and on during the year. So, how, how did you get introduced to the Homevestors brand? Uh, it was interesting. I was. Uh, uh, president of another company and uh, that was uh, in uh, a different, totally different industry uh, that was right after 9-11 was really hit hard. And, uh, and in 2005, I had a good friend that uh, was uh, new homebusters and knew the then CEO at the time. And he recommended I go meet with him. And uh, that was kind of what the beginning of uh, a long, uh, history and uh, a fun ride. Well, maybe you could talk a little uh, bit about, oh, Sean, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Homebusters brand. I think you're best known for the We Buy Ugly brand, but behind the scenes, you've got Homebusters. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, of course, the company was started in uh, 1996 uh, by Ken D'Angelo. Uh, he was the founder of it. He was a realtor, uh, went on a, a listing appointment trying to list the house. And the lady said, you don't understand. I want to sell my house today. And so he <laughs> bought the house and, and uh, he uh, fixed it up and resold it. And he said, you know, this is kind of uh, neat. He made more doing that than he did on uh, listing houses. And so he started buying houses. Uh, and then in uh, say, you know, this is, seems like a, can be something we could get, teach others to do because that's part of what his passion was. And so he started the, the uh, Homebusters brand uh, in 1996, started uh, with uh, the franchise at that time. Uh, but uh, his advertising you know, was, we buy houses and he'd get all these calls of people wanting to list their house. And the, the reality is, uh, you know, he was, uh, that, so the, the We Buy Ugly Houses came out of that, uh, how to define what people really want. We don't want uh, new houses that they ought to be working with a real estate agent. We want the houses that need significant repair. That's what we buy. And so he started, uh, he was kind of a, uh, a genius at the deal. Every uh, advertising people says, don't do that. That's negative advertising, you don't want it. Yeah. He said, it's gonna work anyway. So he did it and it turned out <laughs> it worked. And that's kind of the beginning of a, a long story. So, wow. so brilliant. You know, it is all at the end of the day about finding your, your niche, right? And everybody wants to try to boil the ocean and do everything. And by doing one thing well and one thing better than the rest, uh, you can see uh, much better long-term success. You guys have been at it for quite a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that's why we've grown so much because there's so many people want to get in and uh, do real estate, but then they say, how do I find the houses? And that's what our brand and our advertising and our marketing does. It gets people to call us. Walk us through how that, that works, right? It, it, as I understand it, you guys aren't buying the houses yourselves, right? And you're working with partners or franchises, something along those lines. Kind of walk us through big picture um, how your model works. Yeah, the, the big picture, we have the systems. We have everything from uh, the marketing plan on how that works. We've got the, the uh, whole system on how you price a house, uh, how they go in and look at a house, uh, all the way down to how you, uh, you know, what repairs. We've got an app that works on uh, an iPad. Uh, so a franchise go in and just literally mark based on the size of the house, uh, what it needs. 
and it gives them a recommended price to buy the house. Uh, but the, the, the way the whole system works is we are the brand and we are the whole systems with it. And then the local uh, person uh, is uh, buying houses in their uh, neighborhood, in their city. Uh, so we are a uh, you know, nationwide organization of local independently owned and operated franchises. And okay. they're all, they know their neighborhood, they know their city, and they know what price they can buy it at and make it work. Uh, and uh, so it all works. So you do use the actual franchise model? Absolutely. Yeah, everybody, we are franchising all the franchises and they buy the houses. We don't buy them. The franchise buy the houses, they fix them up and they resell them. Okay. And I'm, I'm familiar with the ad council concept where locally um, you have these ad councils. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Yeah, absolutely. And our, something that's a little unique about our, uh, what our system, most people buying houses, they're very, uh, uh, they, they don't want to tell anybody what they're doing. Uh, our ad councils work as a team and they all work together. Uh, and literally they help each other, uh, but they all form an ad council. For example, here in Dallas, there are about uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, I think it's about 40, 45 franchises. Uh, and they all pool their money advertising wise. They, they uh, uh, basically uh, vote on how they want to spend it. Uh, and then they spend it as a group. And then when a call comes in, it's rotated between them based on what each person spends. Interesting. So it doesn't even have to be even. No. The, the money spent. It's, uh, so uh, Aaron can, ba based on, he can do his spend based on what his goals are. And then Sean's, if his goals are higher, he can spend more. And so uh, there's uh, no requirements whatsoever. They just literally spend at the level they want to. So you came in in 2005 at a very <laughs> interesting time right before the biggest, yeah. greatest recession. Walk Absolutely. us through that journey and what that was like. Holy cow. Yeah, it was interesting. It, it really was. In fact, we were changing our model a little bit then too. But uh, 2005 was the, the towards the end of the biggest run on real estate uh, probably in history. Uh, and then we had the biggest drop that's ever happened in 2008 and nine. Uh, but surprisingly, our franchise did fairly well through that time period. Uh, really? And we bought a lot less houses. And so the company struggled a little bit, but the franchises did well uh, because they, uh, the, the reality, as long as you're buying and selling in the same market, you can do well. You just, when the price drops, you just buy it for less. And right. our, our market, we are selling to are, are the people that we're selling to are typically first time home buyers because we're in that, you know, under the median price and, and investors. And the reality is they're always first time home buyers. There were first time home, there were people buying houses in our market in eight and nine and 10. And they, because there are always people wanting to get in. In fact, there are a lot of people who come and say, hey, this is a great time to get our first house. And so, in fact, our franchise during that time frame did, did fairly well. And the entire time during the downturn, you guys were still going with the direct model. You were still doing billboards and ads and driving people and buying direct. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what we did. And uh, now they had to advertise less to buy a house, but then they made less when they did, but they bought more. And so it, it, you know, it all evens out. Uh, now the market is more competitive and they have to spend a little bit more to buy a house, but uh, advertising wise, but when they do, uh, they end up making more because there's also a lot of people wanting those houses. Right. Because the, the sales side is super strong right now. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Did the, uh, the UG uh, character come along uh, when the brand started or did that come later in the brand cycle? That was later. Uh, we bought the house, it was first. I think it's about 1999. Uh, uh, shortly after that, a year or two afterwards, they were looking for uh, a, you know, something, a symbol. Uh, and Ken D'Angelo came up with the idea of a hug of the caveman. Uh, <laughs> our, uh, we, they hired uh, several people to draw uh, several firms to go do the artwork for it to create what he was going to look like. And our legal counsel, uh, who's now our vice president, uh, Bonnie DePass, 
uh, her daughter was in high school at the time, and she said, well, can I enter? And so she entered it, and believe it or not, she's the one that everybody liked, and she still does the drawings for us. Oh, that's great. <laughs> does our artwork, and uh, even now, and she is an artist out in California right now, and uh, that's what she uh, does for a living, but she still draws Ugg, so... I, I know you guys win sort of a lot of awards for uh, best franchise model, but I think uh, the brand that you've created is so incredibly strong and consistent. Um, I know here in the Inland Empire, where I'm based out of, you know, I still see billboards. How has marketing changed for you guys over the last decade? I mean, during the downturn, you mentioned it, you didn't have to advertise quite as much. And now with digital marketing getting so difficult, how has it changed? Yeah, it has changed a lot. Uh, in fact, we have a whole farm that uh, spends their time doing that. Uh, it used to be, of course, most of our uh, leads will come from phone calls. Uh, now about half of them come uh, online uh, and come digitally. And there's just uh, uh, our brand and uh, what, not just the brand, but also the data, because we have, you know, 22, 23 years worth of data that we have on where we buy houses, on identifying those houses, what houses we buy, which ones we do the best at, uh, and, and who is selling houses to us. And so we track that data. Uh, we have a huge uh, database tracking who it is we're buying. And our, uh, the people that are selling houses to us has shifted over the years. Uh, and we have gotten better and better at identifying that person and then uh, digitally online, going and finding them and marketing to them online. And we do a lot with that. So, uh, be, but about half our leads now are coming online. Interesting. And uh, I pulled your original bio off of an Inman article that I was reading uh, uh, that you wrote for Inman on the okay. institutional buyers. And yes. I, I said, is this, is this bio correct? And when you corrected it, the number of franchisees that you have nationwide is pretty impressive. Uh, how, where are you at these days? We're over 1,100. I think we're 1,150 or something now. Uh -huh. uh, we've gone in 2009 from 165 to 1,100 and plus today. And, wow. and pretty much a consistent, steady growth on doing that. So. And the well, amount of data too that you get to see what's working across all the market. Holy from cow. that many investors, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting watching that with the COVID, you know, and what's happened this year, it is uh, the data and the analytics and how we track it has helped us uh, go through this because very quickly we could help our franchises uh, determine that what's happened with the houses, which ones are selling, what's selling, what isn't selling, uh, and be able to adjust. Uh, it makes us to where we can adjust very quickly and, and help our franchise. Our whole goal uh, is to help our franchises be more successful. And that's what our focus is. How do we help them become more successful, more profitable, buy more houses, and make sure when they buy a house that they sell it for profit? Interesting. When you look at that 1,100 or so franchises, walk us through what it looks like for them typically. Is this typically a side hustle, you know, by a, you know, a husband and wife team? Are these large teams? Does it vary? And, and, and what, it what is their, how many deals do they do? It varies and it varies a lot based on their goals. Uh, a lot of them, Sean, will start uh, maybe as part-time. Uh, okay. Most of them very soon become full-time with us. Uh, some of them with their goals, they like being a single operator and they, that's what they want to do. And they want to buy, you know, eight, 10, 12 houses a year and they're happy with that income. So your small uh, single operators are doing roughly a, a deal a month to one yeah, every two months kind of that's, thing. That's probably right. Okay. Uh, or then we have um, a lot of husband-wife teams, a lot of partnerships uh, that obviously they do more. Uh, and then it goes all the way up. Uh, one of our top franchises out of Houston, he came in buying it for his son. In fact, he owned a bank and he bought the franchise for his son. And now... <laughs> Now his whole family is in it. He is, he is full time. Is uh, all three of his boys are in it. Uh, all, I mean, literally, it's uh, not just the whole family. He's got a huge operation. And they bought, they buy over a hundred houses every year. And so 
it, it can run the gamut. The good news about our model is the, the franchise can make of it what they want to. And okay. want to make it a bigger business with a, a team doing it, they can do that. If they're happy buying 18 houses a year and that's what the income they want to do. And, you know, I know uh, some guys that they like the lifestyle of being able to pick up their kids from school every day and, uh, and they don't want to go build that big team. You know, that's perfectly fine with us. So, Is there, you know, when you look at, there's so many different markets around the, the U.S., right? You get the, the high price markets like you see in California and uh, very low price markets, um, you know, probably a little harder to sell in some of those markets, a little smaller uh, margins in some of those markets. Is there, you know, what's the, the sweet spot for the We Buy Ugly houses brand and, and home investors? I tell you what, the sweet spot though depends, Sean, on the market. Uh, we have very successful franchises in all those markets. We're in 170 cities across the country. Okay. And so whether it's a high price market in Boston, uh, our franchise do really well there, but they do it different. And the ones in Boston, they're not doing rental properties. I mean, rental property just don't, doesn't work in that market. Uh, Birmingham is a great rental property market. Okay. okay. They have to buy more houses to do well, uh, but they can, uh, they have lower margins. So they have to buy more, uh, but their, their uh, rental properties really work uh, in a lot of those markets. Uh, California. What rental properties are some of these folks then buying to hold rather than buying to flip? Absolutely. A whole lot of them. Are. We've oh. got, in fact, uh, most of our franchise will end up with rental properties. Of some okay. Kind. Uh, now, I always uh, just assumed the brand was all about flipping and, you know, fixing up and reselling, but uh, so they, they are buying, fixing up and holding as rental as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Probably somewhere between 12 and 14 percent of the houses our franchise buy, they keep it rental properties. And many of them have that goal is they want to create a rental portfolio and that becomes a retirement plan. Got it. So, so is, is, uh, uh, colony homes and some of the big or any of the big institutional folks, uh, franchise holders. Uh, no, they're not. Stuff? Most most of those big institutional, they're looking for newer houses. Yeah. They want newer houses that they don't Already have to worry it. about repairs. They don't have to do that. And our franchise are buying older houses. They're they're you know I think eighty uh, percent of our houses were built in nineteen eighty five and before, and eighty percent of them are the smaller houses and. So we're just a different type of market. But you know, if you have your own rental portfolio and you, you're you working with 10, 20, 30, 40 houses, uh, you know, it's different when you're a colony. They want to buy newer stuff. They don't have to do the repairs because what kills them is having a, a their mani- have some, a manager managing the properties and then they have to pay a percentage on all the repairs and a percentage. The math just doesn't work. When you've got your own rental properties and you get a call from a, uh, a tenant and you can go send your local contractor there that you have a relationship with, you can make the money work in a lot different way than the colonies does. It's just a different model. Cool. I loved your uh, the story in Emin that you wrote on the institutional investor several years ago. Um, <laughs> I don't think they thought it was going to be as difficult as they did, uh, and they're, but they're still here. Uh, how, how have you seen that model sort of uh, progress over the last few years? Yeah, again, I think they started trying to buy everything and do everything. And the reality is, uh, again, a local investor having local people that can, you know, and, you know, he can go handle some of it himself. It's just a different model. A local guy can make those houses, some of the houses work. Uh, a Wall Street, it, when, you, when you're trying to buy them from Wall Street, and you have, uh, again, you have to go hire somebody to manage it locally. And then you have to uh, hire contractors locally. And you have to, it's just a whole different uh, ball game that you have. So. Not easy to scale. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not easy to scale. Uh, it's easier to scale when you have an apartment building with a hundred apartments. You can put a manager on, but when you sca- have uh, houses scattered all over the city, it's a different game. It just really is. So there's there's a lot of rumors that uh, a lot of these Wall Street companies are you know 
raising millions, billions of dollars again to do the same thing, but we're in a very different place than we were in 2007 to 2009. What do you see for those institutional buy to rent investors over the next few years? It's interesting because <clears throat> where they started was when they were getting deals right. <clears throat> after 08 and 09, and those deals aren't around for them anymore, and they just can't. So a lot of them are trying to buy or buy in higher priced houses. And I worry that their margins are going to shrink more and more. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, but I, I think, again, if they can do the right scale, they, they can be successful at it. Uh, but it's a, they have to be, uh, we worry, we see some of the prices they're paying for some houses. And our guys uh, don't understand how they could, uh, they couldn't make those prices work. Well, our franchises couldn't. They wouldn't try to uh, because they wouldn't buy those houses. So. One of the reasons that model worked, right, is that their cost of money is so much lower, right? And so with the cost of money so much lower and their ability to use uh, leverage at ways the small investors can't, right? Um, especially when they came into the trustee sale market in 2010, let's say, um, you know, they were able to pay considerably more and um, still have that work in their financial model. You know, and that's one place where I see risk. Have you guys looked at, you know, uh, figuring out ways to leverage Wall Street money to, you know, across, because you have a large enough investor network, you probably could attract Wall Street money and, and uh, you know, make that available to your uh, a customer base. And that would be a, a big advantage or differentiation for you versus somebody going out on their own if they had access to much cheaper money. Yep, absolutely. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, with our franchise, we have created a uh, uh, lender portal uh, that we have a lot of different, we have seven different lenders right now that are competing with each other to get our franchise business. And okay. our franchise go in and put the house there and uh, it is uh, the rates our franchise pay has gone down and down uh, because uh, the uh, because of that uh, just the volume and, and the ability that they're competing to get their business and so they have to do lower and lower rates. Did did COVID impact? I I heard um, some of the Wall Street lenders <laughs> sort of backed off really quickly. Did that impact your franchisees? Uh, no, it didn't because we have enough lenders that. Uh, have watched our franchise perform. And uh, in fact, our best lender uh, is one that, uh, that started with us in 2009. And he went and researched all the loans that were done during the downturn and found out that they were pretty safe loans. And so he lit they literally, this, uh, this lender, uh, not only did they not back off, they actually increased the lending to our franchise during that time. Now they were doing lending to other investors outside our franchises. And they, uh, in fact, I got a call one day and said they have, uh, right after this happened, and they said they have shut off every other investor except home investor franchises wow. because they want to make sure they have enough money for our franchise. And so, and they, I think they tripled their portfolio during that 90 days, last 90, 120 days. Huh. The franchise model is very interesting. I mean, listening to you talk about the ad councils, the technology, access to this kind of lending. When somebody's buying into a franchise, there's a lot that's they're buying into. <laughs> yeah, there really is. Absolutely. Do you have a threshold? Do you say no to somebody who wants to be a, a franchisee? What is that? What's the process look like for somebody who wants to become one? Yeah, we do say no. Uh, we've got uh, several. They, there is an approval process. Uh, First of all, in markets, we also limit uh, up to a certain point. Uh, we limit the franchise based on the advertising within the market uh, because we want to, to give our franchises the ability to grow. And so we kind of limit within that. We've probably got a dozen markets across the country that we're not adding franchises now. Uh, but even outside that, we have a pretty uh, strict approval process. We uh, you know, we do, they have an application, we do a credit check, a background check. We want to make sure we're getting good character. Our reputation for home investors is very important to not only us, but to all of our franchises. Uh, so we want to make sure we, we're getting 
uh, good team members to join. Uh, we have a very team oriented uh, model. Uh, and so we let people know when they're coming in that uh, hey, if they're not going to be, if they don't uh, play well as a team member, they're probably not going to do very well with us. Uh, because, and so that's part of what we do too, is help them understand what kind of culture they're getting into, uh, that it is a team oriented culture. And if they're, uh, they, because the ones that come in, in fact, it's interesting how many new franchises say, I'm surprised how many, uh, how open people are to helping and uh, that they'll come in and if uh, uh, a new franchise in the market, our fr current franchise, want them to, to succeed. And if they're having trouble in the area, they'll take them on appointments with them. They'll go with them on appointments. They'll do things to help them that you normally wouldn't see of a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs, but they do with us because, because it's important that they all do well. Do you discourage newbies from getting into the business if they don't have any real estate background? No, not necessarily. In fact, our history, Aaron, is uh, we prefer them without a real estate background. Interesting. Okay? Now, it's interesting because those that have too much background, they tend to where they don't uh, adopt our model. They go try to do their own thing. And they, uh -huh. now, we have, now, that doesn't say we've gotten more and more with them some history. But those that have experience, we have a pretty good talk with them beforehand and say, listen, if you're just going to keep doing what you're doing, but try to use our leads, you're probably not going to be as successful as if you really adopt our whole processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, the ones that do that, they do well. Uh, in fact, some of, our, uh, some of our top people, one of our top guys in California came, they had a great experience. Uh, uh, after they joined us, they very quickly, in fact, I think they sold $12 million in, of houses their first year with us. And uh, they had, a, they really did well, but they came in at training and there were uh, four brothers that they came in and they, you know, we sat down with them at training and they said, uh, they're going to quit doing everything they're doing. They're going to just for one year do everything we say. And they did. And you know, if they'll do that, they'll be successful. Huh. What's the reason that you see people fail in this business? Some of the most common uh, reasons. Yeah, the biggest reason is it, it is, uh, there is a learning curve uh, and it's a pretty big learning curve. Uh, the biggest ones with us fail. Uh, in fact, we've done a lot of research on that. 71% of them uh, buy two houses or less. And they just never get started. They never get up over that learning curve hump. Uh, and, and we tell Aaron when they come in uh, that uh, said, you know, you really don't believe you can buy a house at the price we think. And you're not going to believe that until you do. And then you're going to wonder if I can sell them. And then you're not, you're not going to believe you can until you do. And then you're going to wonder if that was an accident or what if I can do it again. And once you do it a couple of times, we just rarely lose people. Okay, but uh, there are some people, uh, the houses we buy, I mean, they smell. They're, they're, they, uh, you know, they smell like dogs. Uh, they, they, you know, they have a whole bunch of cats. They, they, uh, you know, they're in bad shape. They, uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting. Some people, you know, they go in a house and uh, they walk out and they want to go take a shower, you know, and they're just some people that don't want to do that and uh, that, that won't go through that. And, and so uh, we always say the how you know, with the, when they really smell, you know, that dog or uh, that cat piss smell, yep. you know what that, we you know what that smell is? Money. That's money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, I've got, I definitely have some stories. I, I had one that, uh, that uh, the first clean out crew I, I hired, I got a call and I hear this retching noise in the background and the clean out crew is all on, in the yard and they're all retching. And um, they're like, we quit. We're, we're not doing this job. Uh, yeah. And I finally had to have a crew come in basically in hazmat suits right, to do. Yeah, we get out. We've got those stories. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. I, this is a fantastic transition into the iBuyer conversation. Um, there's a few different <laughs> models going on, but the, the iBuyer model has been very interesting to follow. I, I saw you live on stage. Aaron, and, just, just for the folks at home, what is an iBuyer? I buy Wall Street companies with a lot of money, Zillow, Redfin, Open Door, the, the top three right now. 
Uh, but there's real estate brands like Keller Williams talking about getting into where they do the fast cash as is model. However, so they, they buy the house directly from the owner, yep. do a little bit of fix up and then put it on the market to sell rather than the typical model of taking a listing. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. So we've got these eye buyers. And when I saw you at the National Association of Real Estate Editors, your panel was first and Open Door and the pan offer pad. And I think Redfin was the panel right after you. And I, I approached Open Door and I said, why are you working with home investors? You've got to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars marketing from scratch. And if you say no to the deal, where are you sending them? And at the time, they were so worried about their brand. They're like, oh, we can't work with anybody. We have to have complete control. So when Open Door released their IPO information, I just don't think it was the full story. The amount of money that they have to spend, maybe you can give us some insight into that. How much do you think that they're spending when they open up a new market every month? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot. Uh, it really <laughs> is. And, and that, that's the question right now. Because I know what we're spending. You know, our franchise are spending six, seven million a month in advertising. Okay. And so uh, it takes a lot of money to generate a brand. So they're spending a lot doing that. Uh, but again, they're targeting a different market. And it is, uh, we've got a niche and they, they're, our niche is one, uh, the houses we buy, uh, I mean, I think they'd walk in and walk out. Oh, yeah. They won't even look at that. They, that they do that. Realtors don't want our houses. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, they really don't because a realtor understands either cost, uh, they would have spent twice as much work selling a house that's going to sell for half as much. And why not go sell a pristine house that they don't have to do it? And, and with the house that we, that, uh, that we buy, the realtors would take all these calls. Why don't you get them to clean it out? Why don't you get them to get rid of that? You know, because that's, that's just what we buy. And, and uh, so we've got a niche that is a great niche for us. And it is uh, our franchises do well with those houses uh, that do it. And, but Open Door and the odd buyers, uh, the reality is they, they're, uh, I think their margins, what, six, seven percent, and that includes the repairs in it. And so they can't be doing much repairs. No. And they just can't. And so. <laughs> have they, have, uh, they started contacting any of your franchisees about the houses that don't fit their buy box? Not really. In fact, I've talked to them. Uh, uh, I've talked to some of the key people, and we'd love to do some stuff with them because of that. Uh, but I think they're they, as you said, they're worried about their brand and they're worried about what they're doing. And so, uh, you know, just seems you know. so. It seems so manageable, though, right? To say, hey, listen, you know, we're not in a position to buy your house, right? Um, you know, and you have a few options here, right? We can refer you to somebody for a realtor that can work with you. You know, we can refer you to uh, home investors. We buy ugly houses, right? Um, and, you know, that just seems like such an easy, uh, yeah. it's, you know, they've already spent the money to attract that lead, not to convert it uh, into some sort of uh, downstream fee. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm sure they're sure. gonna do that. I agree. And one of the things that we do, we get a whole lot of leads that ought to go to a realtor. And, you know, we we're trying to see if we can set up with some uh, real estate chains and real estate, uh, you know, different national chains to do some things. Uh, or even iBuyers, because we refer leads all the time to iBuyers. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, we One of the things we do, Sean, is we come in and the first thing our franchise do is they'll tell them up front, every house doesn't make sense for us. And if it doesn't, yeah. We try to refer them to somebody uh, that does that. Uh, and uh, they, uh, so it, uh, we're working on that. Now, what happens with a lot of franchises, they end up working with a lot of realtors locally because uh, they'll get realtors that will tell them that, uh, you know, and, and they'll tell the realtor, if you ever walk in a house and, you know, just by the smell of the house, you can't sell it. Uh, you yeah. Know, uh, refer that to me because I have houses all the time that, uh, that literally they need a realtor and we'll trade leads. And so most of them end up getting a local realtor in that neighborhood that they work with, uh, that they, they trade leads. And, and our franchise will tell them, if I buy a house from you, uh, I'll fix it up and list it with you. So you're gonna get the same listing, but you'll make, you know, you'll make it on a retail listing, not on a lower price listing, so. That's the I mean, I 
Oh. Ahead, I, I, it's such a great, um, you know, the, the referral piece is such a great model. It's so profitable, you know, like um, obviously my background in public records and, and using that, and I'm not doing a lot of flipping right now, but uh, I occasionally want to add something to my portfolio. And the way I do that is I go out and talk to everybody who has one of those things, an apartment, uh, whatever it is. And, um, you know, typically I'll find four or five sellers Right. And I'll buy one of them, but that leaves, you know, a handful of others. Yeah. And if I refer those off um, and as a broker, I can take a referral fee, often 25%. That's real money. And that pays for all the, mar you know, all the outreach that I did to buy the one thing I was looking for. Um, how many of your folks end up getting licensed, uh, you know, just to take advantage of that? Probably half of them. About half of them. Yeah, probably half of them end up end up being uh, realtors uh, and having a license. Now, even if they don't have a license, Sean, virtually all of them end up working with realtors, uh, either on a referral basis, trading leads, and that kind of thing. Okay. In fact, our franchise typically find they do better uh, with trading leads than they do trying to list them. How, how many of your folks uh, with the licenses list their own properties or do they usually list them with somebody else when they're flipping? A little bit of both. Uh, I would say most of them really get to where they know realtors in a local neighborhood and they try to go find the realtor that is the best in that neighborhood because that's our experience. They'll make, they'll make a little bit more money rather than trying to list all of them themselves. Yeah, we have time to do some of both, uh, but the the reality is we we teach them and train them uh, to go help uh, find that realtor that's going to help you sell the house the quickest in that neighborhood and do the best in that neighborhood. Uh, don't try to be uh, cheap and save you you know keep the realtor list yourself. Of course, in the market right now, there's so much demand for houses uh, that sometimes you just have to list them and there are people competing to buy them. You know, so in that case, they may be listed more right now. So I found when I've had a decent volume of, of homes to sell, I can negotiate a pretty good uh, commission. Yep. So it's really not costing me very much. And then you pick up E&O insurance and that kind of stuff, which puts, sure. puts at least a layer between you and, and the other folks in terms of lawsuits and stuff. And, and exactly. so a lot of value to using. Uh, real Absolutely. Time. No question. Do you have franchisees uh, in markets where the, especially when there's more than one of the I buyers competing? So Sacramento, as an example, I have an investor up there who reported during COVID the cost of digital ads dropped because Open Door and Zillow stopped buying. And uh -huh. as soon as they started coming back on, they were bidding up the terms, the you know we buy houses kind of stuff. And then also her her brand names tripled in price because they were bidding against her names. So do you have your franchisees complaining that? They may be popular, popularizing the model a little bit more, but they're also increasing costs for marketing. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is true. And they, uh, uh, of course, we track what they're bidding on because our marketing firm tracks that, what they're doing. And, and you can see what not just them, but all the others are doing. And we're, uh, there is uh, the more competition uh, in a market, not just the buyers. The reality is the eye buyers aren't competing with us. Uh, it's a lot of the other investors that are competing with us and are trying to do that. Now we have, we spend a lot of time uh, protecting our trademarks because we have, you know, we have over 50 trademarks around ugly houses. And that's one of the challenges. A lot of the local investors think that, uh, you know, they can advertise, I buy ugly houses too. And no, you can't. And <laughs> because you know, <laughs> that is our trademark. <laughs> so yeah. I was actually going to bring that up because I, I, I definitely, I actually personally know investors who've gotten cease and desist letters, right? So, um, you know, that, <laughs> Aaron, you'd happen to you? Yeah. And I have to tell you, this is an important thing to cover. I had hired an outside uh, PPC company to run ads. They said that they, their specialty was this space. They did not tell me that they were using the We Buy Ugly brands uh, in their meta descriptions wow. and buying. And I got a letter. And I was really upset because I knew that I knew not to do that. And that was trademarked. And I was really irritated because I got that. Uh, yeah. So you could outsource and not know that this is even a thing. Yep. yep absolutely. So, so I that's why it's important the all the investors, the, 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 whatever firms they use them, you need to make sure they need to make sure that 
uh, even though Aaron, you you hired them and they're supposed to be doing it, you're still responsible for what they do. And yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. I know, do most people do most people comply after a cease and desist letter, and that's the end of it? You send one letter, you're done. That's most of the time. That's exactly right. Yeah. Have you had uh, have you had it go farther than that? And and what's oh, yeah. that look like? Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, second time we file a lawsuit, most of them drop real quickly. And uh, if uh, the third time they're going to pay us money. And okay. significant money, because then it's not an accident. And we've had people that uh, that do that. And the, the reality is uh, that uh, uh, you know most people uh, are trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And I believe that most people do that. There are some people around that just uh, want to ride off of somebody else's advertising, and those people we're going to stop them. We can't afford not to protect our brand. David, I don't think a lot of people understand how trademark law works as well. If you don't protect the brand, you sort of lose the trademark, correct? That's correct. You've so, got to protect your brand. And if we spend a lot of money doing that every year, as you all both know. <laughs> so, yeah. When you spend that kind of money on advertising and, and brand, I, I completely understand. Um, actually, just so you know, you, I, the attorney- David said the six to $7 million a month. So you're, right. you know, that's, that's a pretty serious- uh, pretty serious amount of advertising. That's right. Do you still love direct mail? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it, direct mail has changed dramatically uh, over the years, uh, but it still gets the most uh, predictable response that we have. But a lot of that's because we have so much data. We know we can identify what houses are likely to sell to us and we can make sure we're there. And, but not only that, what we have discovered, direct mail works very closely and very well with the other media. Uh, and the, when we send direct mail out, we watch our online traffic go up and we can bid on terms that, uh, that we know which letter creates what terms online they search for. And so we can, we, we spend the, uh, so just, we know when we uh, have billboards, when we put billboards up, our direct mail response goes up about 50%. So they're, they're seeing the billboards, but they're calling off the letter. And so it all works together. We know on TV, when we go on TV, we know what words they bid on online. And you know, we can, uh, we're bidding based on around our TV commercials. And so it just, it's amazing how the data uh, and how you use that data can increase your results. We talk about um, you know, kind of the investor journey. We've got this, this picture. It starts off like a, the evolution of man, right? Kind of from yeah. caveman to like $6 billion man with like bionic parts, right? Yeah. And um, we, we talk about that in terms of like the real estate investor journey, right? Like at first, like you're out there with the club and you're just trying to club down a deal, right? And at the other end is you really have to be doing multi-channel. You have to be doing, you know, and it, it, your kind of ad spend, you know, uh, you know, 70, $80 million a year. Um, you've really got to be up at that, that level where you're automating and um, getting that feedback loops and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, and going and uh, and then we're doing a whole lot right now, even on, uh, uh, on, the social media on identifying who it is that we that is likely to sell to us, and then how do we go? Not only who is likely to sell to us, but who are the influences of that person? Because right now we're discovering it's not the baby boomers; it's the next generation that's their kids that are influenced their parents, and mm -hmm. or that are inheriting that house. And we're tracking, you know, who it is that is uh, that is actually buying our house and when. And uh, and it's amazing. Uh, I tell you, it's fun watching the, the results and the data uh, and what happens. Uh, we have tracked it over years, and it is it's uh, it's just amazing what you can do too. And then how you can track that person and online see where now how do we advertise them advertise and hit them. On so when Aaron is searching for something, uh, what is it he's searching for, and how can we identify him and then present our ads to him? Amazing. Yeah, it's it's an interesting point. I, I have a uh, 
a friend who advertises to successful, you know, Gen X folks, right? But who have older parents, because at the end of the day, those folks are too successful to go deal with the house after a death. And right. they, they would much rather take a discount and sell it uh, quickly. So, um, so it's the opposite of what you've said. Like, oh, I'd never get a deal from somebody who's successful and you know, wealthy and blah, blah, blah. And it's actually, you're more likely to get a deal from them. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we know it's amazing how many of ours are uh, you know, not just college educated, but uh, we know the income of people selling to us. And it's amazing uh, you know, what that is. We think a lot of that is driven by uh, their inherited houses so yeah yeah sounds like so, you use a lot of uh public records data <laughs> yeah absolutely it, do you put together like an annual event where you're polling i mean this is a, a lot of really powerful information uh, nationwide from a marketing perspective do you sort of create a report for your franchisees every year talking about the state of the industry absolutely very much so uh and we do a lot of it now we also are but we're, we're very protective of a lot of it too, because a lot of it is we, we're not gonna give everybody what all the, sec all the secrets are. Uh, even not even your own franchisees, right? Even our own franchises, that's exactly right. Uh, right. Because it's amazing how many franchises have a, a good friend and they happen to show them to them, you know? And so, uh, but we are getting more and more sophisticated. As we do that, we'll get more and more protective of how we go and do that uh, because uh, our goal is to make sure that our franchises uh, uh, can't ever leave because they can't ever get use that data and they can't ever get to the data. They can't, they can't, the marketing is more effective than what they can ever duplicate outside of it. And once they figure that out, uh, that's the reason we rarely lose franchises, our experience ones. I've, I've been watching the marketing mix and the consumption of information by the consumer. Um, I follow that every year and it's been really interesting to watch things grow um, in, in categories that I'm surprised like TV and radio hasn't gone down. Are, are there any channels that have really lost their luster and you just don't believe them in the, anymore, whether it be TV, radio, um, newspapers? Newspaper. We, uh, we don't do a lot of radio. Uh, the reason we don't is because the people that are listening to the radio also see our billboards. Mm. And so we can, uh, we, by going into TV, we hit a different audience than we do uh, the billboards. And so we, uh, uh, you know, we can drill into radio, but right now radio is almost as expensive as TV and you get a different wow. audience. The, the, you get uh, more uh, bang for the buck we do on TV than we do on radio right now. That's super interesting. And the radio billboard thing, I guess, is because people mostly listen to the radio in their car. And if they're in their car, they're seeing the billboard. That's correct. So that's so why you, are, those are equivalent. Get that audience. And so it doesn't have as much of an impact and a draw for us as TV does. And so. I never would have thought about that. How yeah. about uh, newspapers? Yeah, we do some, not a lot of newspapers. Uh, we do, I think we do more newspapers because of the online stuff, but it's not uh, on newspaper. I don't know about y'all, but I don't get a paper, newspaper anymore. I read the paper every day, but, uh, but I never, you know, I haven't gotten a paper in years. And, uh, but yet, uh, our ads, when you go, you might see one of our ads in your paper, but it may not be placed with the paper. <laughs> That's true. Right, right, because of the networks. So I want to just jump back to, to COVID real quick and um, what you saw there. So you're in a lot of different markets all over the nation, right? You're in some dense areas. You're in some more rural areas. Um, did you see, what have you seen so far in differences between different areas, you know, higher income, lower income, dense versus rural or suburban, you know, et cetera. What, what are you guys seeing there so far in the data? It, it's interesting watching it because our lead flow dropped quite a bit, uh, fairly quickly uh, in March. Uh, April came back some, uh, quite a bit, but we're still lower. Uh, our lead okay. flow is lower. We're getting less people respond uh, to our advertising, but yet we're buying a higher percentage 
of the calls than what we were before. Mm -hmm. What we, uh, the data is showing us, uh, Sean, is we're getting less tower kickers now because okay. we're getting less people that just to call and hey, come out and let's see what my house is. If they call us, they're serious. Uh, a lot of, one of our franchise says, it's kind of like Christmas. I said, what do you mean? So when you get a call on Christmas day, you better answer your phone because that person's serious. They're going to sell their house. You be the one, be the one buying it. And so when they call now, they're less of them calling, but we're buying a higher percentage. Uh, okay. And it kind of makes sense because the reality is you don't want somebody traipsing through your house unless you're really serious about selling. Right. Yeah. Right now, especially the older people, They're, they don't want someone in the house. Uh, yeah. now, the other thing that we've noticed, we, we a lot talk about how we can go uh, uh, do the house virtually. We're buying a lot of virtual houses. Uh, that It's amazing how many of the houses our franchise have bought, they never even seen it, haven't yeah. been inside it. And that they're, uh, we've got a process where they can go around and they can see it and they're showing them stuff uh, and they're buying it. Uh, but uh, sight unseen, but yet they are seeing it because our process is doing it. And, uh, uh, but we found that uh, a certain percentage of the people don't want anybody coming to the house for any reason. Right. And if you take that off, or make it okay. And that's what some, a lot of our advertising is doing is uh, then they'll call and when they're hesitant to let you come out, they're letting them uh, do that. So that's probably what we're, we're seeing more uh, of that. Uh, I've been advising some of our trustee sale investors because our trustee sale investors never get to go inside of houses. I'm like, you guys are uniquely positioned right now yeah. to go out and do deals with folks that don't want people in their house. Like, Absolutely. you know, this should be a boom time for you. And, <laughs> and so few are like taking advantage of it, right? They're yeah. like, just sitting around whining that there's no foreclosure auctions because of moratoriums. I'm like, come That's on, you, you've got a unique value add right now. And we, we kind of watch it because you know, California was probably the slowest state to come back because it's the most restrictive to that, okay? Uh, and they have over the last 45 to 60 days, uh, we're seeing the response rate goes up and the results go up. Uh, uh, but that's been the slowest ones. Uh, states that it's interesting, you can almost watch them as they close down and the COVID goes up, uh, the sponsor rates go down a little bit. And, right. But our buy percentages are increasing at almost the same time. And so, uh, you know, to, so to answer your question, it is, it is varying based on areas. Uh, it, the suburbs tend to be better. Uh, than some of the in, inner cities parts because they're, uh, I don't know, people are a little bit more open to people seeing their houses and coming in. So. What, what about on the, the sales side or, or some of the folks, you know, like in the, in the more urban areas that are having a hard time getting rid of their inventory? Maybe they can buy the inventory but can't sell it or are you seeing anything along those lines? We're having a hard time keeping inventory. It is selling Very so true. fast. It is, I mean, uh, and our across all prices, markets across the market. I mean, and it doesn't seem to matter uh, how. In fact, it seems to tell quicker the more restrictions there. Uh, and part of what we're uh, thinking that is, Sean, is uh, all virtually all of our houses are empty, and so right. there are people looking to buy houses. Uh, but in markets, the more restrictive. People are hesitant to go in somebody's house that they're living there. And if you're living there, you're hesitant to list your house. And so listings go down, the more restrictive. But right. our houses are all empty. And so they're selling. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is un and their uh, average sales price is up 18% uh, over last year. The same, wow. basically the same houses. So because you guys are buying at the low end and the low ends, you know, uh, yeah, definitely moving up faster than the high end. You know, this is one of the problems we always read about median price and median price is so meaningless because it's so different yeah. at the different, you know, levels of market. Exactly. Yep. We had uh, one of our franchises we tell this story. I think he's in Boston that he had, uh, he listed the house on Thursday and on Monday he had 50 offers. Oh. 
that's almost too much work. Like, I don't like getting that many offers. It's too much work. Like, how do you even go through them all and compare them? Like, you have to build a spreadsheet. It sucks. Yeah, exactly. So, Home Investors yeah. is going to start an auction company so everybody can just there show go. up, go cash, and go. <laughs> you might have some. Hey, whatever there. happened to, there was multiple companies out there working where you like submitted your offer through the, the website, right? So that you could yep. see that. And like, I, I don't understand why that hasn't taken off. Like, well, that, that was thing. mostly used back with the uh, foreclosures and selling the foreclosures to those, most of those sites were developed to sell them to the institutions, to sell them yeah. to the institutions. And the reality is most of that's been just gone away. Yeah. So. Do you have many franchisees asking you to expand into more rural markets because of COVID driven demand? We're, we are expanding, it, not just in the rural. I tell you what, we have had more demand for franchise sales in the last five or six months uh, than <laughs> ever. I mean, we have sold more franchises per month in the last five or six months than we have in any five or six month period since I've been here. Uh, <laughs> and we're selling uh, at a record pace every month. And a lot of that I think is driven by uh, a couple of reasons. One is what you just said. Uh, a lot of, we're getting a lot of demand in more rural markets. We're adding markets we haven't been in before uh, outside there. Uh, I think the second thing is that uh, a lot of people are in today's market, they don't want to be traveling. The corporate travelers, they don't want to be, uh, they want to, uh, this is a good time to get in your own business, especially in a business like ours. And, and ours is kind of shown to be resilient. Uh, our franchise have done well through this. And so there are a lot of people that say, you know, uh, I've always wanted to get real estate. This is a good time. Is there, a, I imagine you guys have markets where you'd like to see franchises where you don't have them now. What, what right now would be the hottest market where you'd like to get a, a franchisee that you don't have one right now? So we don't have one. Uh, I'd have to look at what we don't have. We've got them in most of them, Sean. We have okay. a lot of markets that we have a lot of potential. Uh, Chicago is a great one. Uh, to do that. Uh, a lot of the Midwest is uh, that we have that we are growing pretty fast in. New York, New Jersey uh, are uh, market. Right now, one of the ones we're adding a lot, Seattle, uh, we've added a lot. Uh, several of the markets, California, uh, we've added quite a few California franchises the last few months. Uh, so yeah. Where, where, uh, what's next? What's next on the horizon for home investors? What's the next big thing? Are we going into Canada and Mexico and Europe? And what, we, what, what's we next? We have looked at Canada. We are, uh, in fact, we were about to go into Canada uh, when COVID hit. Okay. And so uh, we didn't because, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know that any of us want to travel to Canada right now. So uh, <laughs> that's. Uh, I think that's the next thing coming that we'll do. We'll be in Canada. I think we may want to travel to Canada. I'm not sure they want maybe. us. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but that we're also looking, we've done a huge upgrade in our software over the last year uh, and stuff. We are uh, continuing that trend uh, on doing that. Uh, but those are probably the biggest things. Okay. I'm very surprised that HGTV has not called you for a, a, a TV show. Is that coming? I don't know if they have. We have had different times than doing that. Uh, one of the things they do, Aaron, is they always want you to, to talk about uh, how much money you made on the house. Mm. That's not in our, uh, we don't like that kind of marketing. And we just don't do that uh, because, right. you know, that's showing checks and what they did and all that is just not in our DNA. On what we do. So we, uh, but that's what they always want. So, all right, just it leaves that seller, you know, wondering what if, and it starts, you know, why create bad feelings with the person? Okay. You know, you want to leave them with great feelings that they had an easy deal on the rest, not, not looking at watching it on TV and going, man, they those guys made a lot of money on me and feeling bad about themselves. That's right. The flamboyant person that's a personality on TV show isn't the kind of people we attract. We attract the people that want to help people and, and are willing, they want to make some good money, but they're willing to do it with a lot of work. Uh, uh, our, money, our business is not a get rich quick scheme. It's just not. Those that get this entire quick, business is not a get rich quick scheme no, for isn't. anybody, not just it, you. It isn't. it isn't. It's not a get rich quick scheme. And those that try to 
portray it as such uh, do everybody a disservice uh, because the reality is a trend, a real estate transaction has got to be win for all parties. And if it's not, it's not a good transaction. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if y'all see, saw the, uh, there's an article you got to look up, uh, you can probably see it. Uh, one of our franchises I was real proud of uh, in Chicago, uh, there's a big, it's, in fact, it was on uh, uh, in People magazine and then a lot of different stuff. You can go find it. Uh, he closed on a house, uh, bought the house. They bought it uh, with furniture in it like they did. He started cleaning out and he started finding piles of money. Oh, gosh. He found over $10,000 in envelopes, in cash, hidden behind furniture, under books, in books, all sorts of it. And of course, uh, uh, and this is, goes back to what uh, uh, the kind of franchise we did. He uh, is obvious what he did. He went and called the person who bought the house from and returned the cash. Wow. I will look for that story and I will post it in the show notes. That's, that's yeah, important that's to hear. Okay. That's the kind of franchise we have. And uh, that, uh, that, I, uh, that does not surprise me at all because that's the kind of people we have with us and that's the kind of people we attract. That's great. Well, this hour went very quickly. And how should uh, people follow the Homebusters brand? Where should they be looking? The, probably a couple of places. Go to homebusters.com. Uh, or webuyuglyhouses.com. If you have a house to sell, go to webuyuglyhouses.com. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to find out about a franchise, go to homeinvestorsfranchise.com. Okay. Very okay. cool, David. Thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. Yeah, Thanks. David, appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that, join the community, and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.